there aren't other people who do. It's a classic trap. All right, and so we're. Elizabeth <laughs> and. Every culture has, as I sort of already reported, every culture has its granny wisdom. It's a collection of parables and principles gleaned from years of experience, practical experience, and then it gets passed on from one generation to the next. Kitchen grannies are a special breed, I think. They embody the kitchen culture of their own culture. Somehow, in the last nearly half century of living in Japan, it seems I've become a kitchen granny myself. I hear myself coaxing, coaching, chiding the way I was, at first by my mother-in-law, and later by shopkeepers, by local neighborhood gossips, anybody who had an opinion about this foreign lady who was trying to figure it out about Japanese food. Um, today, I have an opportunity that's extraordinary, and I can share with you what this kitchen branding has learned about the Japanese indigenous food culture. It's called washoku. My first encounter with this way of washoku was a bit of serendipity. Uh, landed up in Japan in a rural community, living with a family and a household. Uh, spoke no Japanese at the time. And um, observed around me a rhythm and a pace to the household that was uh, compelling. At the helm of all of this was a woman by the name of Kiyoko Ando, eventually she would become my mother-in-law, but that's another story for another day. Um, <clears throat> can I stop? You can hear that. Yeah. It's going to be a problem. Uh, what I noticed about the way she moved around her household uh, is that she used everything that there was to the best possible advantage. She managed somehow to put many meals on the table for many people uh, all the time, with grace, with flair, with a sense of aesthetic pleasure at feeding all of these people. What fueled and inspired her, I later learned the word for it, was kansha, the sense of appreciation about what nature could provide, and also about the clever people who could take what nature gave them and nourish others with it. Uh, this sense of kansha in the kitchen turns out to be using food fully, no waste at all. Um, there are certain guidelines that help people in the practical application of this wonderful notion. And um, they're in groups of fives. The Japanese speak of five colors, five flavors, five ways. And they're a convenient way of organizing information when you're having to plan a meal, prepare a meal, and even when you're partaking of it, when you're eating it, it's something to be mindful of. So the five colors are red, green, yellow, and black and white. And one of the things about color and the pigmentation of food is it usually is a good indicator of what the nutrients are. And think about red wine, beets, red foods have antioxidants in them. So if you eat a full range of color, uh, in every meal, you're going to have balance without having to do complicated technical uh, nutritional analysis of your meal. You're going to have a full range of, of nutrients. The five flavors, the big three ones, are sweet, sour, salty, and then you've got accents of bitter, spicy. It's all about feeling a sense of satisfaction in your food and avoiding food cravings. Being able to achieve balance among all of them means that you won't feel that you need to eat more food than comfortably makes you full. Um, the five ways are spoken of uh, as actions. You have simmering, you have steaming, you have uh, searing, you have uh, Frying, you have uh, consuming foods raw. Why do you need such variety in all of that? Primarily because it gives you an opportunity to use very limited food resources and explode the possibilities on it. Uh, most of you may admit that you watch Iron Chef, and the whole notion originally behind Iron Chef was indeed just that. Imagine. Battle of the Daikon. You've got a sweet simmered chunk of it that's sauced with a smoky katsuobushi. 
you've got a seared pan that's touched with soy sauce and maybe a little bit of yuzu. Um, you've got it grated raw. It's the same radish, but three entirely different eating experiences. So that's part of why all of these methods are incorporated in every meal. So the idea of five colors, five flavors, five ways, it helps you organize, think about uh, getting the most out of what you have in terms of putting together a meal. Um, when the Japanese speak of, of eating, they also speak of time and place, and sort of the coordinates almost on a graph. You are in a particular place at a particular time, and time is usually expressed as seasonality, and everyone in English is comfortable with the expression in season. It means the peak of flavor. So we're here in Texas now, and I understand peaches are your thing. And the season <clears throat> when peaches are going to be their best is July, June, July, and August. Um, and that's fine, but the Japanese have a much richer vocabulary to describe the before and the after. It's anticipation and also regret at the end for something leaving the market. Um, hashiri literally to run is eager anticipation and it's what you feel on a raw rainy March day and you can't wait for July sunshine to warm you up uh, and you see a peach in the market it's expensive you know it's not going to be great but you got to have it anyway and you're going to buy it and take it home and experience that um, at the other end come September you thought you had all the peaches you could ever eat and you see one at the end of September, beginning of October, and you say, gee, I can't wait another whole year. I'm going to have to have it again. And that's nagori. This is this sort of lingering desire that will not leave you. And the Japanese plan meals to incorporate. The, the highlight is on shun, or this moment of peak of flavor. But very definitely the anticipation and also this end regret, this lingering desire that makes the meal. In addition to the actual preparation of food, there is the aesthetic pleasure and the aesthetic hunger that needs to get fed in a Japanese meal. And a lot of it has to do with the relationship between vessel and food, um, and how the food is positioned in that vessel. Uh, it's an opportunity for a creative chef to satisfy their own sense of creative. It's a canvas on which they can create um, their own scene. And also watch the pleasure that the people who are eating their meal uh, are going to have. Um, <laughs> totally lost, <laughs> lost my thread. <clears throat> the end, or at least I'd like to be here right now. <laughs> well, it, you yes. are time-wise over. I know. Yeah, and so, and so are you close to the end? I, Yes. <laughs> All right. All right. So, so, so you've gotten to the end of that part. Now, how would you end it? Um, in a way that I sometimes do, and I, and I, when I shared it with a few people, they said that's probably a good thing to do. Okay. Is um, you don't have to be Japanese. I'm not, and I don't think many of you are. And you don't have to be in Japan, as far as I knew. We were in Austin, Texas, at the moment. Um, to be able to appreciate and apply these washable notions to your daily eating. Um, and my understanding was that then it could segue into the chefs. And in fact, now that you've you know, heard about it, you're going to actually get a chance to experience it. And it's my pleasure to introduce whatever. So uh, uh, um, more technical note, right. there should be a contact. So that is why that's being. So as we were planning, concept of fearing less. One of the issues that we found in our culture is that people don't engage with food for certain reasons and sometimes they have fears around them that they don't even understand. So as we were exploring this topic, we asked ourselves, what is it that stops people from engaging in food? What is it that holds them back to say, eh, that's a little bit scary to me or that's really not for me? So in our search to understand and to find those people who are thinking deeply about how we engage in food and how we embrace it in ways that have not been familiar to us, we came across a lovely woman who's living in Japan. Her name is Elizabeth Ando. Please welcome me. Please join me in welcoming her to the stage. Elizabeth? Thank you. Um, I landed up in Japan quite 
serendipitously. An opportunity presented itself uh, to live with a rural family in Japan. It sounded like a good idea, and I went. I spoke no Japanese at the time. I was a keen observer, uh, and I noticed a number of things, particularly the rhythm and pace of this household that I landed up in. Uh, the woman who was at the helm of this household, Kiyoko Ando, eventually became my mother-in-law, but that's another story for another day. Um, and what was remarkable about what she did was she used everything in creative ways, fed a large group of people every day, many times a day. Uh, whether it was taking a scrap that was left to peel from a daikon and not throwing it away but making another dish out of it, a uh, tablespoon of tofu that became a creamy sauce for something. Um, what compelled her and what drove her was a notion that I later learned was called kancha. Um, and kancha means appreciation. It's appreciation in two different ways. It's appreciating what nature provides, and it's also appreciating the people who are clever enough to access that bounty and nourish themselves with it. Um, and it was beyond intriguing. Let's try weight on both feet. Go ahead, okay. keep going. Weight on both feet. It was beyond. Both. There we go. Okay. It was beyond intriguing um, and uh, wanted to give it a go myself. Uh, eventually had an opportunity to study with uh, some culinary masters in Tokyo, the Yonagihara family. And the elder gentleman who um, started me off, uh, it's not working. Um, okay, we're, it's working for us. So were you afraid you were going to go off into another story? I landed up in Japan quite by a serendipitous accident. I had an opportunity to go stay with a family in a rural community in Japan a long time ago, nearly half a century. Um, and at the time, I spoke no Japanese. Uh, I was fairly observant and utterly fascinated and drawn to the rhythm and pace of this household. The household that I landed up in was uh, the head of it was a woman by the name of Kiyoko Ando, and if the Ando sounds familiar, yes, she eventually became my mother-in-law, but that's another story for another day. Um, and what particularly intrigued me about the way she managed this household was how she was able to feed so many people so many times a day, <clears throat> so well, on almost nothing. Uh, she had a very frugal budget. She had uh, decidedly old-fashioned equipment that she had at her disposal. Um, and yet she had a mindset, she had an approach, she had a way of doing things. And she herself did not articulate that. It was so totally uh, a part of her action, her practice, her daily activity, um, that it was only later that I learned this word kancha. And kancha is what really fueled and inspired her. It's a sense of appreciation. And it's a word that's used in Japan not only about food, but when it is used in a culinary context, it usually means two things all at once. It means appreciating what nature provides and also appreciating the people who enable that bounty to nourish others. Um, and watching and observing her practice, Kancha was just uh, a, a life-turning uh, experience for me. Um, I later learned another word, and that word was washo. And washoku was really the larger umbrella idea. It was the set of notions um, about how you approach food and you source it, you use it. And at the heart of it is a very straightforward concept, and that's harmony, balance, that's created at table. There are some very convenient categories that are uh, spoken of. There's five flavors, there's five colors, there's five ways, um, and these were really guidelines. They enabled people to take their resources and utilize them well, because at the heart of this kancha, this appreciation, is nothing should go to waste, using food fully. So the five colors, uh, red, yellow, green, black, white, 
Um, if you think about food and how it's pigmented, think about red wine, or perhaps you prefer beets, who knows? Um, they have a lot of polyphenols and antioxidants, all that good stuff, and that's true about all food. And the pigmentation tells you something about the nutritional value of that food. Um, so if you're attentive, mindful of having a colorful range of food at each meal, you don't have to worry about doing complicated nutritional analysis. You're going to have a balanced uh, nutrient uh, in, your, in your diet. The five uh, flavors, the big three, are sweet, sour, and salty. And the Japanese think of bitter and spicy as the accents to a meal. And what that does is provide you with a sense of satisfaction. It helps you avoid food cravings. Um, if you have balance among those big three and then you've got these little accents, you can um, feel satisfied without having to take in more food than you really need. The five ways enable you and, and they're expressed as actions. Uh, you can simmer, you can sear, you can steam, uh, you can fry, you can consume foods raw, apply no heat at all. Um, and what they do is enable you to use very limited food resources and make them interesting, varied, um, and also uh, an opportunity to showcase the creativity of the chef. And in fact, that was the driving force behind the original Iron Chef. Uh, think Battle of the Daikon and having that single radish become a dozen different dishes with a dozen different personalities. Um, this convenient framework, the five colors, the five flavors, the five ways of, of making your food, um, it's an easy way to get a handle on managing food every day. But washobu, this notion of the indigenous Japanese uh, food culture, if you will, is more than just the preparation of food. It's also about time and place and being in a particular time at a, a particular place um, with each and every meal that you're making. Time is usually a question of seasonality, and we often speak of foods being in the peak of, of flavor, at in season. Um, the Japanese add other words to that vocabulary, and those words are hashiri, literally to run. It means eager anticipation. And if I were to take uh, peaches as an example, it would be not, you can't wait till the summer in order to bite into one. You see one in market on a rainy, raw, miserable March day, and you buy it, and you eat it, and you delight in the prospect of what's to come. Uh, similarly, at the end of the summer, you think you've had your full, and then along comes the end of September, you see another peach market and you absolutely have to have it. The Japanese call that nagori, which is lingering desire. Um, it's also a word that's used not only at table, but especially at table. Um, and there's this larger understanding of the time frame, the seasonality at which you're eating. Um, place has to do with um, the notions that many chefs currently uh, throughout the world are focused on uh, limiting, using local foods, limiting the carbon footprint. Um, but the Japanese add another dimension, which I don't think has yet um, been utilized in many other food cultures. And that is that you purposely source foods from different terrain. Um, it's a surf and turf mentality in Japan. It has to do with uh, foods uh, from the ocean, foods from um, uh, the land, and in Texas it could be anything from your inland waterways and your deserts to the uh, flatlands. Um, the notion that you would have foods from different terrain also helps balance your, your diet. Um, all of these elements originated and, and were uh, came out of Japanese culture, but they have a universal message. Uh, I'm not Japanese, I don't think many of you are Japanese, but that's no reason why you can't appreciate, practice, and benefit uh, from these washoku uh, notions. Okay, that's eight.